All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, my name is Stacy Conkeel and I'm the Director of Research and Education at Altmetric. Uh, more importantly, I'm the chair for the next session that's about to begin, tackling the challenges of Altmetric. We've got a great lineup of four speakers today who are doing really interesting things uh, to, in consideration of these grand challenges that we've been outlining so far today and to a great extent yesterday at the Altmetric 17 workshop, which was excellent by the way. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce Clément Gévaudan from the Global Development Network, where he is a senior program associate. He's going to be speaking about research diffusion practices in developing countries. What can we learn from altmetrics? Uh, the PowerPoint is the second one. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you to everyone and the conference organizers. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Clément Gévaudan. I work for the Global Development Network, which is a public international organization based out of New Delhi, India. And uh, GDN works to support the work of uh, social science researchers in uh, developing countries. So this presentation is going to be situated very much in the topic of uh, research assessment in a development context. And I'm going to present you some of the work we've done. Um, we're going to look at some data and um, I'm going to try to engage the debate on how to assess research and uh, what to assess in research. And so quick look at the context, the content of the, the presentation. We're going to replace the context of social science research in developing countries, then uh, look at what is being done to support research and to assess it, and uh, finally, uh, what can be the role of altmetrics in assessing this research. So uh, let's jump into it and uh, say that uh, the context for social science researchers in developing countries is not very favorable. Uh, there's a lack of uh, policies, infrastructure, uh, very few local journals um, based out of universities and research institutions uh, in developing countries. Um, for example, one of the studies that we've supported recently uh, showed that in Côte d'Ivoire, 45% of the surveyed research centers and departments uh, didn't have access to a physical library. Um, another study showed that uh, very few of the researchers who publish uh, research on a particular country actually come from these countries. So, uh, for example, in Indonesia, 12% uh, only of the research published on Indonesia are published by Indonesian researchers. Uh, in China, it's only 21%, and in India, it's only 25% of the research uh, which is published by Indian researchers. So, this is a problem because, oh, the slide is slightly cut, okay. This is a problem because research, we believe that research should be contextualized in the context of the, the country it studies, and this is even more important in social science research uh, as compared to natural sciences, which, uh, where social science research doesn't answer to universal laws, so it's very important to, uh, to contextualize this country. So this is very worrying for the situation of research. And uh, we're going to see by looking at some data that uh, there is a very important research gap between the north and south. So let's look at this data, and this is uh, the share of researchers uh, in the world. You can see the share of low-income countries is barely more than 1%. Uh, this shows that there is a problem of critical mass in the developing countries. Uh, this is an issue for notably for incentives on researchers, uh, job opportunities, the development of a professional sector of research. Um, if you look at investments in research, um, the amount of uh, research which is uh, invested in, the amount of funding which is invested in research and developments in low-income countries is far less than in other countries. And uh, this is visible also if uh, you look at uh, the number of publications. Uh, you can see the, the upper line is for North America. Uh, the red line in the middle is for Europe and Central Asia. And then you can see all the other regions uh, straight at the bottom. Um, with uh, East Asia in the first, but this is largely, largely drawn by uh, China. And looking at some altmetrics data, this is visible also. You can see that this is um, um, a map 
of mentions in news articles for every article published in top 50 development journals. Um, it's quite a large sample of articles, and most of it uh, is taking place uh, in the north. You can see only like a very few countries in the south, such as South Africa or India, uh, but we know that these are already the leaders in terms of research um, in the global south. So um, what can be done about it? This, um, there, have, there are research grants, capacity building, institution development, a variety of programs and actions that are being implemented by the international development community. But the thing is there is no relevant metrics to assess what we're doing. So actually all of these programs are done in a blind way. Um, there is a development agenda, which is formed by the Sustainable Development Goals, but none of these goals actually target uh, research uh, and very few target higher education even. Uh, innovation is part of the SDGs, but research isn't really. There are few initiatives that value the role of research for development, but it's actually not being tracked, uh, or not very well for lack of metrics. So what we're trying to do here is to link uh, systems analysis, research support, and research impact to understand what can be done and how should we do it to actually support the research in developing countries and bridge this gap. So GDN is doing this through four lines of services. Uh, research diagnostics, which is what I'm gonna talk about just after. Uh, research management, where we support the work of researchers and give uh, research grants and so on. Capacity building, so we have a program on uh, least developed countries, for example, and we, we do some uh, demand-led actions. And uh, research use uh, by giving the floor to uh, developing country researchers in conferences and so on. Um, just one of the ways to support actually research is to do demand-led actions. But there are very few funders who are ready to give support to something which is uh, demand-led. So for example, uh, a research institution in a developing country is going to say, okay, I want to create this program for my university because I think it's going to be good. Very few funders are just going to say, okay, we give you the money to implement your ideas. Very often, it's actually supply-led, so it also comes from the north. And we don't give the, the, the voice, we don't lift up the voice of these people. And this is uh, just a cover of uh, the strategy of GDN, which is downloadable on our website, and uh, there was also a few copies, I think, uh, on the desk outside. So GDN came up with the Doing Research program, which aims to nurture the role of research uh, as an input to inform policy and debates through research systems analysis. And what we are proposing is a program which involves comparative mixed method approach for assessing research systems. So this is based out of the pilot phase, uh, where we funded case studies on 11 countries, um, and um, a two-year pilot phase, which was followed by large global consultations with policymakers, researchers, and funders, and we came up with uh, a methodology, an approach to assess research systems, uh, social science research systems, actually, but this can be drawn also to uh, research systems more generally. So the program has three components, research, data, and outreach. I'm going to mostly talk about the first two uh, today. And the methodology that we propose is uh, done in three steps. Firstly, we aim to understand the context during a, during a large qualitative assessment of the context in a given country. Then we want to map uh, research actors, both suppliers and uh, users. And finally, we assess uh, the research system based on a framework that we've developed um, to assess the research system. There are few other initiatives which are trying to do similar kind of things, uh, notably the OECD is measuring uh, science, technology, and innovation through their scoreboard. Uh, there's INASP, a UK think tank, which has a program on strengthening research and knowledge systems. Uh, LSV also is doing some similar things, I think, with research trends. It's a little bit uh, the similar kind of topics that are tackled. Um, and uh, we are proposing this uh, doing research framework, as we call it. So I apologize in advance for the next slide, uh, which is a bit heavy in information. Um, but I recommend that you focus on the bold uh, lines, if you can read it, where uh, we show basically the process of doing research through a three-column framework uh, based on production, diffusion, and use of research. 
And where altmetrics come in this is mainly in the diffusion and uptake. Uh, it's not used, it's uptake, actually. Um, I think that one other comment we can do on this framework, and it reflects to what was said in the, this morning about the fact that altmetrics are actually not really alternative, they're complementary. I think this is uh, useful to say that uh, the production of research refers to the traditional metrics as we know them, uh, while the diffusion and uptake can really be drawn from altmetrics and other sources uh, of data. So this is useful to document the, the research process. Let me zoom in on the diffusion and uptake of research where we can see the role Altmetrics can play in this. And um, basically you can see that we're looking at online visibility through blog posts and tweets, uh, media and advocacy through news stories, the fact that research can be a popular science through Facebook posts and Wikipedia pages, and the policy use through uh, policy documents. So a few of these indicators are drawn from Altmetrics. Others would be drawn from primary data that we're going to collect, and others can be drawn from um, in a database from the World Bank or the World Economic Forums, which also have uh, useful data on this topic. Mm, and here we are looking at some altmetrics data on uh, four countries. Um, we've drawn the top 100 cited papers in each country. So these are the top 100 cited papers that are tracked by Altmetrics. So there's really 100 papers that are measured in each of these uh, data sets for every country. And um, you can clearly see the, the, the dominance, the supremacy, we could say, of South Africa um, between these four countries, South Africa, which is really the, the leader in terms of research uh, in Africa. Uh, it's interesting to see that uh, Kenya is doing better on policy documents. But, uh, and, and then you can see also Tanzania and Rwanda, which are slightly behind, although uh, you see that uh, Rwanda is uh, more better at tweeting uh, or, um, or at the, the blog post also. And from this, we are looking at um, altmetrics indicators, blog posts, Facebook posts, uh, policy documents, and so on. But we could also use this data to build some composite indicators, for example, to understand whether there is a popular culture of research uh, in those countries and include this in the doing of research framework, uh, which I've presented be, uh, below. Um, then, uh, so the possibilities are pretty much infinite. And once we have this data, we can, uh, we can aggregate it in several ways. Um, just to uh, complete on this, what are the benefits of Altmetrics data for us and the limits? Uh, it allows us to track how the research outputs are uh, diffused on the web. Mm, it can inform the degree of the influence of the research culture and strengthen the case for better referencing of developing country articles. I'd like to add that it also creates an incentive to research funders and research users to actually use this data from Altmetrics. Um, for the purpose of research assessments. And the few limits that we can tell are the limited coverage of developing country journals, uh, limited coverage of policy sources. I'd like to also add that uh, it's a bit hard to see the coverage of advocacy uh, using research because there are lots of uh, international NGOs that are citing research uh, in, their, uh, in their papers or on their websites. And um, this is so far uh, a bit hard to track. And it is difficult to aggregate numbers at the national level, although I've attempted to do it uh, now. So just to conclude, um, we try to propose a view of national research systems as a different lens of analysis uh, on research assessment to analyze the process of doing research rather than analyzing what is done with the product, because we believe that uh, doing research is really a process. It doesn't stop with the publication and it doesn't stop in journals. I think this is shared with the view of Altmetrics. Uh, this is also an opportunity for Altmetrics to be used in a development context, uh, since I think there has been limited use so far. Um, and uh, let me mention also that this is an upcoming project. So there has been the pilot phase, but the framework that I've presented uh, is currently, we're currently fundraising actually for, uh, for this program. So it's not yet under implementation, but we hope that it's gonna be um, throughout the end of the year and uh, next year. So we're looking for partnerships. We're looking for financial support, uh, small or large. Uh, we are working with the uh, Southern Research Institutions, so the people who are going to implement this research 
uh, will be strictly from research teams in the concerned uh, countries. Um, and finally, I'd like to add that well, there gonna, there's going to be more work on research systems uh, at GDN, notably with the upcoming Science and Technology and Innovation uh, for Development Conference uh, in New Delhi uh, on 11 and 12 of uh, December this year. Um, and we're hoping to get some more work uh, running also with various partners. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. And Thank you very much. We'll take questions uh, towards the end of the session all at once. Uh, next, I'd like to invite up Andy Herzog from the University of Texas at Arlington, who is the Department Head for Faculty Services and Online Engagement. Andy is going to be speaking to us about bringing altmetrics into normal. So my presentation is PowerPointless. I was going, I am going to talk about a service that we developed at the University of Texas at Arlington, how that led to the adoption of altmetrics and what we learned, including that we should not be using the term altmetrics. To give some context first though, I want to briefly mention where I'm from, the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, before today, has anybody heard of this institution? Oh my gosh. You guys had destroyed my uh, crowd demonstration. That was a little unexpected. Um, the University of Texas at Arlington has recently ac acquired R1 Carnegie classification, but often we are not looked upon as a prestigious university or a research-heavy university. So being aware of research metrics and the research metrics associated with our faculty's work because of this is particularly important. That was the, the context. Um, so the service that we developed last fall in 2016 is we developed a metric consultation service for faculty. Um, we would have an um, interview with a faculty member um, for about 15 minutes, half an hour, hour. We would gather what was important to them, and then we would build a customized report. And so the goal? No, just me talking. Um, so the goal of this was not to promote altmetrics, though altmetrics is a key component of it. The goal of this was to support our faculty, help them understand the different research metrics of their work, and in a way to show the different ways that their work is reaching different people and how it's being disseminated. So very much that when we had this consultation, we framed this conversation around what issues they're facing, what problems they have, what questions they have, what does their field value in terms of metrics? What does their college value in terms of metrics? We didn't start with a pitch, we started with questions. And I think this is echoing a previous presenter as well, framing it around the questions that the faculty have. Um, taking cues from the, the Becker model, we asked a number of questions about their work, how they communicate, um, and also again, what's important to them. So often, this consultation resulted in, of course, first and foremost, they're interested in journal impact factor, they're interested in citations, but in the context of this conversation, it's an excellent way to introduce alt metrics, even if we're not using that word. In our consultations, we talk about usage, we talk about captures, we talk about social media. These are words they quickly understand, and they usually um, are interested in including them in the report. I think about of the 40 people that we have consulted with, about 39 of them um, were wholeheartedly on the usage and the captures. Uh, social media was less successful because in many cases they were not actually active users of social media. But in this case, they were interested in usage metrics, captures metrics as part of this profile that they would most likely be using this report that they'd be using for their promotion and tenure or for a grant. And they also, it is a great way to get kind of under kind of the questions they are feeling that they know about their metrics, what they're interested in. Um, some are interested in how interdisciplinary their work is, some interested in showing progress over time throughout their careers, and others, of course, are just more of that type of benchmarking. How can they show that they're valued compared to other people in their field? 
So some of the things that we learned throughout this consultation service is that we want to make it as jargon-free as possible for faculty. And so that's why I kind of started out with the idea of not talking to them about altmetrics in that word, but talking about them about usage, about social media, about buzz, and what that, what that means for them in the context of their research. Um, framing the conversation around their faculty issues, not around uh, the different metrics themselves. Um, we also found that most faculty know even less about metrics than I expected. Um, I think everyone's heard about journal impact factor and, and citations, but beyond that, largely there was a lot of uncertainty about what these metrics are and whether they should be using them or not. So actually having a consultation as part of this process is a great way to both gather information but then advocate for different things and the pros and cons of these different metrics. Um, our pilot run had uh, 15 participants. Like I said, at this point, about a year in, we found about 40 consultations. And this has largely occurred with little marketing. Uh, we are really seem to be meeting a need that our faculty are having, and they are, are responding without us even doing that much marketing. Um, one of my colleagues was actually presenting our new service to a group of faculty, and she actually received a round of applause. And that is not something that I'm, I'm typically encountering when I'm presenting to faculty about different services the library have. And, and so I, just another kind of anecdotal uh, point of bit that this does seem to be interest of faculty, that there is some concerns that they have, that they're over Christmas break, they're trying to figure out what's the H index, what's the G index, where should I go for my citations, and that's a need for them. Um, as part of our official assessment of our pilot, um, we just had nine, um, out of the 15, we had nine respondents. Everybody was extremely satisfied or very satisfied with our service. Um, perhaps more of interest of the nine respondents, three used our entire report in their promotion and tenure um, dossier. So that's definitely, we know that those three are including altmetric data in the promotion and tenure dossier. Um, four others said they used a lot of the data. And so I don't know if that lot of the data included these usage, the captures of social media, but I'm, I'm guessing that they're picking out the most interesting data points that most um, show them in the best light for their promotion and tenure dossier. We just had two that used little of our data and one person who did not use very much of our data, which I suspect it was because the data that we were able to give them did not put them in a flattering light. So that, that is what we have, what we have been doing and what we have learned of about a year of this new program. And I feel very confident that it is a great way to bring this conversation to faculty in a way that makes sense to them. And at the same time, uh, while not the focus of the presentation, it's an excellent opportunity to talk about open access, to talk about ORCID, to talk about depositing in our institutional repository, to talk about Twitter as a way to disseminate your research. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Johan Swords, uh, the assistant for the vice rector for research at University of Vienna. Johan will be talking about the social sciences and humanities in the maze of the new metric. Hello, everyone. Stacy, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, present the results here today. Um, as you already heard, I'm with university administration, so I'm one of the chosen few, like Martin Kirk, who, <laughs> who talked in the, uh, in the morning. And um, I also share kind of the same problems, maybe some, some other kind of problems, because my special interests are on the research evaluation and assessment of research output in the social sciences and humanities which is a whole different ball game to the sciences and to the medicine, as most of you will know. Uh, there are a lot of limitations and caveats, um, especially due to the limit data, uh, limited coverage in databases. Language bias is a big issue in Austria, uh, since we are a German-speaking country, and, um, and many more. So um, I have a small present. So, okay, how do I start this? Touchdown, okay. Oh, so it's, it, it stays so small. 
Uh, okay, 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 sorry. Um, so what I will present here today is um, a small uh, a survey we conducted uh, in the part of a larger initiative conducted at the, uh, initiated at the, at the University of Vienna in 2014 um, to assess the publication cultures and um, publication practices and also views on research evaluation and research evaluation techniques in the social sciences and humanities. Uh, you see the University of Vienna, we are one of the largest universities in the German speaking world. We have around 96 thousand students, around 10,000 staff, of which are 7,000 academics, of which nearly 50 to 60 percent can be attributed to the social sciences and humanities. So this is quite a big issue for us to get the research evaluation right. Um, but as existing uh, literature and also probably your own experience will show, uh, are the, the current methods, for instance, like mostly the uh, bibliometrics based on citation metrics, uh, often fail to meet the demands of the social scientists and, uh, and uh, social sciences and humanities um, because of the re reasons I mentioned before. So with the rise of new metrics, we get a new set of tools which offer, in my opinion, probably a, a really, really, nice, um, a really nice way to complement the classical indicators. Uh, and. Um, for instance, uh, especially regarding the tracking uh, of research output and the assessment of so, uh, societal uh, impact of, um, of, uh, of, um, <coughs> of research. So, however, um, before we can, we can use any of this data and before we can use this for, uh, on the policy level or to flesh out uh, new indicators for, for, to, uh, for to, to assess research output. Um, some, some more knowledge is known about the publication practice and, and habits, habits and also about the views the researchers have on this kind of uh, indicators um, in the social sciences and humanities. So what did we do? We made a small online survey conducted at the university in summer 2014. Um, we sent out around 3,500 questionnaires, uh, received 524 complete responses, which co corresponds to a response, a response rate of, uh, of about 15%. Um, in total, we asked the researchers around 35 questions uh, um, with um, covering all aspects of scholarly life, from information retrieval to um, what, what kind of publication channels are used uh, and so on. Um, today, I will only uh, present a selected few, which we believe are uh, of most interest to, uh, to you people here today. Uh, for instance, regarding the use of personal profiles and identifiers on the web, um, how and uh, if uh, you, the, the scholars use internet services or, or, show, or social media to disseminate and to promote their research online. And also of the how they judge the suitability, uh, how they judge the suitability, of, uh, suitability of views and downloads uh, as indicators for the assessment of the societal impact of their publications. Um, further, we wanted to know uh, how and if they're interested in the social media response of their publications, and if they're interested in institutional support by the university uh, regarding uh, the use of the, uh, of the internet or social media channel, uh, channels to promote their research. So here I show you a few selected results of our study. <clears throat> About half of the researchers we, we surveyed maintain a web presence linked to the institution without provisions of full text, which means that more of the half, more, more of, the half of the researchers don't have um, a web presence. Uh, regarding the personal profiles, 44% use academia, about 35% ResearchGate, 22% Google Scholar citations, 50% ORCID, 2% Mendeley, 3% Research Rate. Uh, we also found uh, a lot of differences between career stages and the various subject fields, which I will show you on a subsequent slide. Um, around 53%, so nearly half of the researchers, we ask perceived views and downloads or usage metrics as appropriate proxies for assessing the societal impact of publications. Uh, also here we found different differences between career stages and subject fields. 
Um, 65 percent are basically interested in the social media resonance of their own publications. And also here we found differences between career stages. However, we didn't find any distinction between the fields. Um, there's only little awareness for self-marketing of publications. So uh, only about a third of the researchers we ask use mailing lists to promote their research, 20% Facebook, 11% Twitter, and 6% Wikipedia. So when I heard the, the presentation of Ian Eddy in the morning that the Twitter um, activities are like skyrocketing uh, in, among the scholars, this trend has obviously not caught up at the University of Vienna. 11% of Twitter is, I think, not that much. Uh, however, also here we found differences between career stages with uh, early stage researchers, especially at the pre-doc level, being the most active and the most interested in this kind of promotion technique. Uh, and also a majority of the researchers we ask would like to have some form of support by the institution, by the university. Uh, they, they, they want advice in what kind of uh, channels to use to promote their um, research most efficiently. And also um, they would like to have help maintaining these pro profiles because, you know, the academic life has a lot of burdens and a lot of the researchers see this as just another burden they have um, which, which they need help with. So on this slide you see um, that there are um, a clear distinction regarding the personal academic, uh, between the use of personal ac academic profiles between the subject areas. Uh, while academia.ed is pro pro more prevalently used by the um, humanities and the theology, okay, this, this is cut off, at, is this? Okay. So this slide is a bit cut off. It's not all, the, all, all, all on the slide as intended. So, um, but I sum it up for you. So uh, academia edu and, um, is, is, is predominantly used by the humanities and theology and the, uh, and the researchers from, uh, from the field of law, whereas ResearchGate is more prevalently used by the social sciences and to a le lesser extent Google Scholar citations is used also by the social scientists. So for, for the, to, to give you a better, better comparison, we grouped the various social sciences fields, the various fields into three groups, whereas social sciences one is probably the one containing the more hard social sciences. Um, ORCID is used not, not, not very much, and there's also no distinctions by the fields, and Research ID and Mendeley is used uh, not, also not, not very much. So um, on this slide, you see that this is, there's a clear distinction uh, in, in the seniority, whereas the trend is the, the higher the... the, the um, the, the, the stage of academic um, proficiency is the more um, the more it increased the use of um, academic profiles. So you see the postdocs and the senior researchers use uh, personal uh, more use them more often, personal academic profiles, whereas the pre-docs and the teaching staff don't use them so much. Uh, especially, this is especially obvious, for instance, with Google Scholar and the ORCID profile. This is the green one. You can, oh, sorry, this is, this, cut is, this, cut is, this is cut off. Um, but you see a clear trend. Uh, the higher the academic uh, level, the, the more the use, uh, the higher the, the usage frequency of personal academic profiles. So this slide is also very interesting. Um, we wanted to know uh, how the researchers uh, judge uh, usage metrics, uh, so page views and downloads, as indicators for societal impact. And you see there's a higher acceptance, ex acceptance for that kind of indicators in the social sciences, um, but also in the law and in the, in the field of uh, law and theology. Um, and, there is, uh, and, and only to a lesser extent, uh, the researchers think that this is a non this is would be a non-suitable indicator for uh, judging societal impact. Whereas in the humanities, it's, the, it's a totally different picture with um, <clears throat> a higher percentage of, of researchers um, are more skeptic uh, towards uh, page views and indicators, uh, page views and downloads as, as an indicator for societal impact. 
so on this slide you see that there's also a kind of a generation gap. So uh, whereas uh, the, the early stage researchers um, uh, like teaching staff and Redux, they think page views and usage, met, uh, and usage um, counts uh, more suitable as an indicator and this, this, this decreases with, with a higher academic stage. So the postdocs and the senior researchers, which are mostly the, the professors, they, uh, don't think, um, they don't think that um, page views and indicators are that suitable as the, the younger researchers do. So on and and this slide you see finally see that um, also, we, uh, when, when we ask the, the researchers how they would, how they are interested in the, in the, in the response and the resonance of their own publications in the, in the social media, uh, they see that the highest interest are with the early stage researchers, uh, especially the pre-docs, uh, and it, this, it, this, this interest decreases with, in, with, with, with uh, increasing uh, academic level, and also you see the senior seed researchers are the most skeptic uh, regarding uh, the, the, the resonance um, of their research in social media. So what do we do with this kind of information? Uh, it is clear that uh, this, this, the, the results show us that the, um, or confirm that the social sciences and the humanities are a broad and diverse field. Uh, and uh, when we regard them um, um, for for, and then we regard, uh, when we think about new metrics and ask about what kind of policies can we make to implement the usage of new metrics at, at the university and also how we can, what kind of indicators we could make and also how, what kind of um, service structures would we, kind of, uh, would we like to develop to, um, to su support the university, uh, to support the researchers and the social scientists and, and humanities to use the internet and social media channels to help them promote their research or help them to, um, to advertise their research. Uh, we have to think and we have to discuss this kind of, um, we have to discuss this with the researchers from all the fields and we have to discuss this with the researchers from all career stages. Only so we can get like the full range uh, of um, the full range we want to have. And um, because currently this, this is a big issue in Austria, like the, especially the, the question of societal impact and how to measure societal impact. And, um, and within this discussion, uh, the, 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 the question of how to build such indicators to assess research output and assess research output, uh, societal impact of, 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 of research output is really important right now. So we're currently um, working on this, on this kind of discussion and kind of working uh, on, 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 on developing such kind of support structures for researchers. Um, and this is a work that is currently ongoing. But we will also continue um, this kind of study we have since we, we, we feel that we still do not have like the full scale of information we want in order to have, a, to have the full picture. So as a next, uh, there's like a fourth project phase in line and we will interview the early stage researchers because we found out in this study that they are the most active in this kind of field and they also are the ones who are more, um, more especially interested in, in the kind of tools and, and also in kind of support structure. So this will be next. And also we, will, we are totally interested in all the developments in the field of new metrics and especially our, our library department they are great specialists working in this kind of field and we're involved in a big European project together with the University of Graz and the Leibniz Center in Kiel. Uh, and also our library will continue its ongoing co collaboration partnership with the Mansions and Art Metrics. So we're really um, eager to see all the new trends in these fields and how we can use them for, um, how we can use them discreetly to build relevant indicators uh, for, the, for the university that also apply to all the researchers, not just the sciences, medicine, but also uh, the social sciences and humanities. So um, the study I talked about uh, now, just now, you can find it online. It's unfortunately the most part is in German, but there's an English abstract, and also you can find all the numbers and graphs. Um, you can ask me about this later on, and the full slide set you find on my academia.edu profile. So that's for me. Thank you.
Fantastic. And then finally, we have Jagris Hodson from Royal Rhodes University, uh, where she is the program head in the College of Interdisciplinary Studies. And Jagris is going to be talking about the unintended consequences of online engagement for female academics, a discussion for the altmetric community. Hello, everyone, and thanks for sticking it out with us. Uh, it's been a great day. Uh, so uh, today I'm talking about a re research project that I've recently begun with George Valetzianos, who is our Canada Research Chair in Innovative Learning Using Social Media. Uh, and so the thing we would really like to talk about is we've heard so much today about the potential of using social media in the altmetric community, and I think it's an important potential and one that we must embrace. But we must embrace this potential knowingly, and we must embrace this potential being aware of what um, could be an unintended consequence of, of moving forward. And so this is going to cover uh, that topic, look at some preliminary work that we've done in the area, and maybe some ways that you can get involved. So we're I'm going to briefly touch on, we've, you know, we've done it today already, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but why do we do this? Why do we use social media to be public about our scholarship? And I'm going to talk a little bit about the perils of being female and being online. I'm going to outline our study and show you some preliminary results, and then I'm going to discuss uh, implications that we want to discover or, or discuss when we are talking in our um, different events throughout today and tomorrow. So, of course, network scholarship is the emergent practice of scholars' use of participatory technologies and online social networks to share, reflect, critique, improve, validate, and further the scholarship. It's sharing your scholarship online, which is what we do want to encourage. Um, we know our academic lives today are imbued with technology. And 30 to 70 percent of academics already use various social media platforms. We saw some of that uh, in the presentation that preceded me, but also throughout the day in our great keynote this morning. Of course, we know that social media is a tremendous resource for public scholarship and also a resource for measuring the public scholarship, right, in the altmetric communities. Um, opportunities are available to share research with the public in new and innovative ways. And so we're all facing increasing pressures to make ourselves more visible online. Um, Unfortunately, that comes sometimes at a cost, and we have to remember that if we are measuring social media as a type of alt metric, that what we matters has weight, or what we measure has weight, or what we measure matters, and it will encourage people to go online. But that can also encourage other behavior that we did not intend, including cyber harassment. And there is a type of cyber harassment that has been studied in higher education, and it's considered to have a unique locus between school and the workplace, right? Because higher education is unique in that way. And this means that women in higher education can neither avoid using social media nor abandon their identity online. Abandoning your identity is one uh, measure that often people use uh, when they're being subject to harassment online, but as an academic, you can't always do that. So let's talk a little bit more about this. Uh, so incidents of online incivility, harassment, and abuse have gained increasing research and media attention in recent years. Now, over 40% of users surveyed in the United States have expressed some form of online harassment and have reported emotional distress as a result or fear for their physical safety. So this isn't just online either. It's fear for your physical safety. It's fear for your families. And responses to online harassment include self-censoring, deleting profiles, ceasing posting, generally removing yourself from the Internet or from certain platforms, um, stopping uh, to write in the genre in which you were receiving harassment, or using a pseudonym. Now, Cassidy and Fauché conducted a survey of faculty members at one Canadian university, and their results suggested a gendered experience of harassment as well. So in addition to reporting a higher level of cyber harassment, 22% reported being harassed in the last year, or 22% females reporting being harassed in the last year compared to 6% of males. And female faculty members were far more likely to even complete the survey and talk about being harassed. So existing literature in the academy and related to the altmetrics community presents no clear definition of online harassment and what it entails. And this is still largely unclear legally, socially, and academically in the academic research around online bullying in the academy in general and in the altmetrics community in particular. So we've started to look at this and we've been talking to some female academics. Um, we've been asking, so what are female academics' experiences of harassment on social media? What is the nature or type of harassment towards female academics on social media? 
and how prevalent is it? And we've begun a mixed, method, uh, mixed methods investigation in which part one has been conducting interviews. And part two will be to send out a more larger scale survey. So what have we found? Well, our respondents so far in interviews, this is where we're at, is in the middle of part one, are reporting that they are facing increasing pressure to go online. It is something that raises their profile, especially young academics, and it also raises the profile of their institutions. And so they can often feel like when they you know, walk into their uh, institutional meetings, there's either spoken or unspoken pressure to go online. They t discuss to us the impact of online abuse and how that feels. Um, they use words like dehumanization and discuss how that trickles into other aspects of their work. And uh, they mention that this is not just occurring on social media, it's occurring in other places as well, um, wherever there are sort of a faceless or the opportunity to dehumanize. So our respondents note the professional pressures to be online, and they come from varied sources. So there could be sociocultural, as in I'm a young up-and-coming academic, I need to sort of work harder to be there. Uh, it, could be, it could come from peers often, and it does also come from administrators. And this pressure is felt differently across various levels of careers. Um, however, it's also been noted that researchers might find restrictions when it comes to opening, openly publishing their opinions and thoughts. So sometimes there's even a limitation in what people will tell us based on where they are in their career. And when a personal opinion is not in line with the institutional policy or when the individual researcher voices a critical opinion on institutional policies and practices, even around something like all metrics, they may find themselves in a conflicting situation. So institutional pressures are exerted with varying force and consequence across the spectrum. Now this is really interesting to me. One of our respondents reported feeling like they had been slimed when they wrote about their research in a blog post. So our respondents are reporting psychological and emotional impacts of what they're experiencing. There's a fear of safety. They start to feel like they're burning out when they're reporting on their research and they're subject to online abuse or bullying. And it affects them. They wonder whether they want to continue being online at all. And this is where I think we really need to have a rich discussion in the altmetrics community, because if we are um, advocating for social media to be used as an altmetric, but there is a group of people who get bullied for whatever reason, and they don't want to be online anymore, and they remove themselves from that situation, because we know that that is one of the strategies that people use to avoid this type of impact, then they won't get measured if social media is the measure. So I think that's really important going forward. It's not that we shouldn't advocate for the use of social media in altmetrics, but we also have to remember that this stuff happens and we have to be prepared when it does. So respondents also reported they felt they were not being treated like human beings. And in the literature, anonymity seems to play a role. So when people can comment on work anonymously, it seems to lead to nastier comments. And that's what some platforms or some social media platforms lend themselves to more than others. For example, Twitter, highly anonymous and highly subject. I mean, we've seen it in the news, too, to, uh, to bullying. Now, an unexpected finding that we've had so far is people feel like they are also being bullied, or, or, or women we have talked to feel they're also being bullied uh, in such venues as anonymous online course evaluations. And uh, one impact of this is uh, burnout-related symptoms and uh, the increasing pressure and dehumanization uh, associated with bullying. Now, here's an example we have permission to share with you. I hope it's sort of visible. I know the screens are, are a little light. But this is from the, the Twitter account of, of Kelly Baker, who has um, invited us to share this. Um, this is when she talked about her research online. Uh, she's saying there that she got one respondent who called her a host of not very nice terms reserved for women. Mostly he threatened violence and death. Um, so after she published a New York Times op-ed related to her work, she was deluged with threats and general nastiness. So there's that new New York Times is another way we might measure all metrics. And she said, which, which amounted to a really terrible 72 hours and her desire to never write for such a big, well-known publication again. So here's where I think it really needs to come into our altmetrics discussion. She says, strangers telling you that they think you should be beat up and die is the weirdest experience. They hate me enough because of what I wrote. And they will tell her that in various venues like Twitter. So these things can happen. And what happens when... We are asking people, oh yeah, you should absolutely mobilize your knowledge in the New York Times, or you should write about it on a blog, or you should tweet about it. Sometimes this is what happens. And this happens um, 
to women and to marginalized communities more often than it happens to other people. So implications, right? We unintentionally may emphasize online participation, social media participation, or putting yourself out there in large venues that makes uh, marginalized communities and women uh, easier to find. So the unintended consequences of this could be extremely devastating psychologically. Um, we have to remember that what we measure matters and what we advocate for matters. And we have to start asking questions like, well, what might a feminist or intersectional approach to altmetrics look like? And what I want us to talk about maybe going forward and in our discussions today and tomorrow is what can we do as a community to adopt a feminist approach to encouraging alternative metrics? Because we absolutely should do these things, and there's so many good reasons that we talked about earlier, but we have to do these things with open eyes. Um, so, you know, if a few next steps to sort of help us think this through, please begin to have more of these discussions when you're talking about altmetrics and advocating for them. And please uh, work with us. So, uh, you know, I'm still looking for women uh, who want to talk about this issue. And so please come see me if you're interested or if you know women that might be interested in participating. Um, and if you are not cis female, how can you support your female colleagues whose experience online might be very different than your own? Uh, and then uh, the final next step came from our unexpected finding, which was, does this trickle over into online teaching? And I know we had a presentation today about looking at syllabi as one way to view altmetrics. So maybe that's, you know, again, there's, there's places to expand beyond, you know, traditional ways of, of distributing knowledge. So uh, thank you very much for your time today and attention. All right, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, would you please, if anybody has a question, uh, approach the mic. I can, of course, get us started. I think there was a lot of excellent things to think about uh, that were brought up by our presenters. Um, so my first question, I guess, is for Clement. Uh, you talked about the interest um, in your group in terms of developing composite indicators based on alt metrics. Can you maybe just speak very briefly to what sort of examples you might have, kind of what you guys are thinking about, and how you would even go about building those composite indicators? Sure. So this is on? Yes. OK, so you know I uh, presented the doing research framework, this big table. Mm -hmm. And in this table, we have different determinants of the research systems, and each determinant has a number of indicators. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to uh, build the composite indicators out of each of those single indicators. And some of them would be used for, for altmetrics, for example, taking um, Facebook posts and Wikipedia pages to look at uh, popular science mm -hmm. so that you can have a composite indicator look, uh, looking at popular science. And we want to use uh, weight on different uh, kinds of determinants. So that's basically how we want to build aggregates, putting weights, different uh, importance uh, according to the process and the determinants. So if you want more information, actually it would be pretty complex to go in depth you know, into the building these uh, composite indicators. Uh, all of this is in a document, a program document, where you can find this framework also uh, on our website. And um, Something else that is important to say also is that we want this data to be in open access and customizable. So uh, we want them to release it and allow people to put in their own ways and build their own indicators uh, through, the, um, through the, the system on the website. Fantastic. Hello. I think I'm the only person for whom this microphone is hided properly for. Very special right now. So I'm going to thank you, all four of you. I don't have enough time to ask each and every one of you the questions I want to, but they're all really interesting. Um, your presentation is really interesting. My question is for Clément. I've done some sort of similar research about uh, language and regional bias in altmetrics and looking about the, the strength of each of those. Uh, I was just wondering when you're looking at creating this uh, infrastructure, from what I saw, one of the biggest problems was indexing. So the research framework is great, but if um, research from organizations or from institutions that aren't in the global north aren't being indexed, they can't really have attention captured to them. So I was wondering how you're going to account for that. Because just for example, when I was doing my research, I found that there was only one institution in Scopus for Haiti at all. And um, 
So it was really hard to try and quantify that kind of research while looking at their attention. So yeah, I was wondering how you were going to account for the indexing problem. So, uh, you know, I presented uh, the three steps to do the method. So it starts with the context assessment, where we look basically at the broad environment for research in a given country, and then there's a mapping. So the looking at the context allows us to look at which are the main research institutions in a country. Then the mapping uh, allows us to go one step uh, more into details, uh, trying to map these centers. And then we're able to uh, draw a survey and interview, you know, these actors. And so by doing so, we also reach out to those papers who are not published. But it's a huge work. And uh, indeed, it's very complicated. So from the indicators that we have, uh, there are different sources. And some will be from Scopus, some will be from Altmetrics, some will be from those surveys and interviews. So we need to, we need to do with the, the, the data we have. And most of it, indeed, should be collected by actually going to the country and, uh, and uh, asking the people to tell us what they have published and so on. Awesome. I'm, I'm saying actually going to the country, but it's not exactly right because we want locals to implement the, the, the research. Yeah. That's very, very cool. Thank you so much. Uh, Jagers, I have a question for you. Um, one comment and then a question, I promise. Um, but so the comment, I guess, is uh, that uh, you, you talk to this idea that um, female academics, as they're harassed, have to consider maybe taking themselves wholly offline, which could be detrimental to their career. But um, I think the challenge there is that even where academics themselves aren't active on social media, their papers can still be talked about and they're still getting harassed. You notice if you're in the altmetric database as much as I am. I, I've anecdotally found plenty of instances of people who do race studies research or gender studies research who just have terrible things that are said about the papers themselves. So the researchers might not, have, not even be aware of it, but they're still being harassed, and that harassment is getting picked up by altmetrics aggregators. So that's, I think, kind of a, a, a side challenge to, to what you're describing. Um, but so my question is, um, I'm going to ask you to speculate maybe on what you think a feminist approach to all metrics looks like. I know it's very preliminary, but if you wouldn't mind speculating a little bit. Uh, thank you. I actually had a really interesting conversation about this the other day um, with uh, one of the people from our library who is somewhere in the audience today. Uh, and I, we started speculating about, well, how can we quantify some of the you know, other labor that goes into um, being a you know, functioning researcher? And I think this really speaks to Rebecca's great presentation from earlier. So having you know, compassion and collegiality and those sorts of measures somewhere um, with, the, with the other metrics and finding ways where we can account for um, the, going beyond um, citations or mentions. Um, so so I, I would love to yeah, so highlight a lot of the work that has been done by Rebecca's group because I think they're absolutely moving in that direction and that's the first place that I would start looking. Excellent. All right, so um, at this point I'd like to thank our speakers again so much for these fantastic presentations. Thank you. So now I guess we'll move on to the lightning talks. I could invite the posty presenters to come up on stage, please.
welcome to this. The Can you hear me? Welcome to this, the very last presentation for today. Um, the sad news is that we're almost halfway through the conference already. The good news is that you're about half an hour away from a drink. It's good and bad. Uh, it, the better news is that we've got um, a very quick lightning round, half an hour, to present eight fantastic research posters, a lot of which are at the back of the room. Um, this is a chance for our presenter. Let's just, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Maddie Watson, sorry. I should have started with that. I'm from Crossref. I'm a product manager and I'm part of the uh, 4AM organising committee. More importantly, though, I'm here with these uh, authors of the, pre of the presentations at the back of the room. They are going to be around um, standing near their posters or in the area to answer questions. So keep all your questions to the end of the session. They've only got three minutes each, unfortunately. So I'm going to sit at the front of the room and give you a little wave when you get close to three minutes. We're going to whip through really, really quickly. Um, but please do join us for a drink afterwards. Uh, come read the posters. Uh, there is some fantastic research that's been happening um, across different fields and altmetrics and um, come pose your questions to these authors. So let's make a start. Uh, first up we have Lauren Collister from the University of Pittsburgh with a presentation on altmetrics and the scholarly legacy. I suppose I can just start talking because you probably couldn't read my presentation on the screen anyway. But I want to first acknowledge my co-author, Ashley Taylor. She's an archivist at the University of Pittsburgh and could not make the trip today, but she put a lot of work into this poster. And here is the premise of that poster. So altmetrics have been described as most useful for recent works, especially for social media attention, because as we've heard a lot today, social media is influenced by the promotional work done by journals and publishers and by the authors themselves, and as well as bots, as we also heard today. And it's also influenced by a scholar's existing digital footprint. And oftentimes, the usefulness of this attention shown by altmetrics is quantified in the terms of future citations or future impact. This is the context that led to our poster because you see we accidentally created a PlumX profile for someone who did most of his work between the 1960s and 1990s. Uh, that person was a retired professor, professor of surgery at the University of Pittsburgh and father of modern transplantation, Dr. Thomas Starzl. And to hear how we accidentally created this Profile, please talk to me in my poster. You're welcome for the instant conversation starter. So when we did this, we noted with mild interest that he has a huge number of citations, north of 20,000, um, which as is expected for somebody who basically pioneered organ transplantation, but also as expected, his social media use was pretty low. However, after his death on March 4th of this year, we noticed a dramatic spike in his altmetrics, particularly in social media accounts. And it makes sense, right? A beloved scholar and mentor and hero died, and people grieved, often publicly. Through these interactions, physicians and researchers who had been his students or mentees or colleagues identified themselves. They shared not only their connection to him, but also the works that he had done that made a real impact on their work or their patients and especially those beyond his landmark liver transplantation study. So this is the aspect of his scholarly legacy that we expected. We didn't know about another part of his scholarly legacy that we discovered when we started looking at his profile. It was a bit of a surprise, and it was about some work he did with colleagues on whether race is a factor in transplantation matches. Spoiler, race does not factor into matching organ donor and receiver according to his work. So this work is regularly used on social media to debunk some pseudoscience and borderline white supremacist arguments that attempt to argue that people of different races cannot donate organs to each other. So people highlight a part of his article that specifically debunks this and share it on social media and use it as final proof. 
It's pretty amazing. And we only discovered this part of his scholarly legacy through looking at his altmetrics profile in PlumX that we accidentally created. So this information, both the expected and the unexpected, has been added by the archivists to his file that they keep with his papers. And using these tweets and the memories provided by his colleagues, they explore connections and the depths of his legacy. And I invite you to come by our poster to learn more and see some examples. Thank you. And next up, we've got Jane Burns from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jane Burns, and I'm an Ometric ambassador for Ireland. Um, the topic of my post is connecting and understanding the web of research for medical information. And I'd like to acknowledge the support from Ometrics and also from the Royal College of Surgeons, the School of Nursing, to allow me to attend. All research has a life cycle. In medical research, this is an expanded process. The start of the cycle is the identification of a solution to a disease or a condition or a pathway to care. Application and receipt of funding is the next step coinciding with the research pro project's development. And then upon completion of the research process, the following questions emerge. What is the impact of this research? Has the research made any kind of difference in the multiple range of areas? In health, we hope to see that research has impacted on social or political policy or care guidelines. The use of all metrics is a key component in the understanding of this research cycle process. A strategic initiative by the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland has been to increase our positioning in the Times Higher Education rankings. Great strides have been made to make these extensive research programs increase their citation impact and this has resulted in RCSI moving up the list to a current position in the top 250 universities. Our researchers are involved in a range of areas, such as nursing, bioengineering, cancer, cardiovascular care, simulation, as well as the mining of tweets to determine what people are discussing about online about breast cancer. The use of bibliometrics, social media, and all metrics to measure and monitor attention and impact is a key, component for, a key component for our institution. The use of all metrics allows our researchers, especially our early career people, to see the various ways and outlets their research is attracting attention, as traditional, traditional citations do take time to accrue. An equally significant aspect of our organization is the development and measurement of individual research profiles, especially in online formats. Through the use of all metrics, we can see where our research is being communicated and in what formats and to what audiences. And equally important, we can see where we are not attracting attention and then realign our communications to our intended research audiences and make these adjustments. By using a matrix, which is a combination of traditional bibliometrics, repository management, web metrics, and all metrics, we are able to provide a fuller picture of our research management for Royal College of Surgeons. Thank you. Next up, we've got Lucy Conkill from Altmetrics uh, with her post of Disciplinary Differences in Altmetrics for Humanities Research. Thank you, Maddie. The subtitle uh, for the poster we decided kind of last minute is Are or are gender studies researchers trolled more often online? Um, so humanities research um, in general, anecdotally speaking, if you're in the altmetric database as often as I am, you notice that it can uh, incite a lot of passion in people, whether that is uh, history research being uh, interpreted and discovered by new audiences or in the case of uh, gender studies research, uh, inciting uh, some passions for um, reasons that I personally don't understand, but everyone's entitled to their opinion. Um, so. Basically, in starting out with this line of research, uh, Alex, my uh, co-author, and I uh, were really interested to know whether gender studies research does actually get trolled more often online 
than other types of humanities research and also sciences research. Uh, we, you know, anecdotally have seen this. Um, I've seen gender studies research referred to, uh, if you're just looking at the Twitter data in our database, uh, researchers have been called things like idiots and fanatics, and pardon the expression, but libtards, um, and even more unsavory things by general public, uh, which has been um, obviously harsh to hear as a gender studies researcher uh, as I was in my previous life. Uh, you don't necessarily see that as often with the sciences, at least not in my experience, but what Alex and I wanted to do was actually uh, you know, scale this question and to understand, okay, is this actually an issue? Are gender studies research, is it being discussed much more uh, negatively online? So we looked at a subset of journals from uh, gender studies, cultural studies, and paleontology. We extracted Twitter data from our database. We cleaned it up a bit. Uh, we ran it through two, two tools, uh, the Natural Language Toolkit, uh, which is built for Python, it's open source, uh, and Mike Thelwell's Senti Strength software. And we found, in line with previous studies done uh, on sentiment analysis for Twitter, that most of the discussions of research are, in fact, neutral in nature. Uh, but we also found some other interesting things, which I'm going to be a tease and say you should come visit me at my poster uh, during the cocktail reception if you'd like to know more. Happy to share it there. Thanks. Next up, we've got Miriam Moraza from the University of uh, Leibniz with Exploring the Meaning and Perception of Altmetrics. Hello, everyone. Um, Today I would like to talk about part of our research that uh, we are doing in the metrics project. Uh, in this project, uh, we aim to get a better understanding of uh, metrics used for research evaluation. Um, you all know GitHub, uh, which is a, a rep um, repository hosting service. Uh, the question is, is, um, is as, uh, having a star on GitHub for piece of code for computer scientists? Is it as informative as having a star for social scientists? Is it worth, uh, is it worth more or less, or is it equally important for both disciplines? Uh, so in order to answer questions like this, we have to know how um, researchers of different disciplines, different uh, scientific ages, and different backgrounds uh, use uh, social media. So. Um, what we did was uh, first uh, we made an uh, exploratory study and um, we looked at uh, the demographic characteristics of researchers and their uh, social media usage. Uh, we created an online questionnaire uh, with around 20 questions about the uh, intensity of usage of social media uh, and um, uh, in their professional, in researchers' professional lives. Uh, we had a lot of participants, about uh, 3,400 uh, researchers from um, more than um, 85 countries uh, and from different disciplines uh, took participated in our survey. And uh, I should mention that our focus was mostly on uh, social sciences and economists. And in uh, our survey, we uh, looked at the popularity of the services, the frequency of uh, usage of services and also the audiences of the services. Uh, so we answered uh, several questions like um, which are the most popular services that uh, people use at their work, uh, for how long uh, have they been using those services, and is there any usage difference when we consider demographic characteristics and, and differences. Um, one of the main findings uh, was that uh, the older and more established researchers um, are more interested uh, in activities that uh, showcase and evaluate their research, like activities on the web of science, uh, while younger and um, less experienced researchers uh, are more uh, fond of services um, um, related to the practical aspect of their work, uh, as, uh, and also services um, uh, for accessing scientific literature, like SciHub. 
And so, yes, if you would like to know more about the, our survey and also the usage patterns, please come to our poster and have a talk with us. Yeah, we are looking forward to that. Thank you. We now have Lauren Maggio from Uniform Services University with using altmetrics to understand how common paywalls are for research articles in news stories. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I first want to say also thank you to my amazing research team. Um, I get to work with Juan Pablo Alpern, who's here from Simon Fraser University, Laura Moorhead, who's in the Department of Journalism at San Francisco State University, and John Malinsky at the Stanford School of Education and the Public Knowledge Project. So this research team, we were counting it out today, has worked together for longer than we'd like to admit, and we've been very interested in looking at the way um, physicians access information. And what we realized with physicians was they had been conditioned not to click on links as they saw them out in the world because they knew they were going to hit a paywall. And so that raised questions for us about, well, okay, that's the physicians. They should have better access than most to the research. What happens when the public engages with research articles? And so we wanted to look in news stories first. And one test case that had us really scratching our heads was in 2016, there was an article published by the New England Journal of Medicine. It was about overscreening with mammography. This came out in October. It was Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Awareness was heightened to breast cancer. However, if you clicked from one of those more than 100 news sources to the article, you would have hit a paywall. And as a woman and as a, having loved ones with experience with breast cancer, I wanted access to find out, are we overscreening? Should we be looking at this evidence? Um, so we pushed a little further and we asked, so in oncology, how common are paywalls for research articles? Um, we reached out to Altmetric and they provided us with all of the 2016 news stories that had links to cancer articles. Um, we also reached out to the folks at OADOI, even before it was OADOI, and they helped us to determine for the 67,000 plus news articles that came out, they linked to 11,523 journal articles. 60% of those were closed access. Um, we were also very interested in our group in terms of funder and, um, funder and governmental policies related to public access. Um, so for example, we found almost 25% of these stories were published in, within a day of the article publication, 50% within two weeks, 75% within the first three months. So if this had been, for example, an NIH-funded article, you might think, well, you're going to have the NIH public access policy pick it up in a year. But a year out after seeing the research appear in the news, you're not as interested anymore. Um, so in conclusion, we feel that Health Journalist has an amazing potential to facilitate facilitate adoption and integration of evidence-based healthcare. We don't think they're reaching their full potential because their audiences don't have access to that information. Um, this, we, when we ran this study in February, we felt it was really important to get this information out to the public, so we pushed it out on Medium. You can see it there. Um, also, I for, did not print the poster, so I pushed this out. It's on Figshare. You can access um, that information there. And Juan and I are both here. So please feel free to stop by. This is a tiny piece of a much larger research program that we're working on. Thank you. Bet you all didn't expect to be quite in the spotlight in the way you are right now. <laughs> Next up, we have Elaine Lester from uh, the University at Albany uh, with her presentation, Adaptable Impact Instruction for Campus Constituencies. So I uh, left my printed poster at home. <laughs> um, the URL up there uh, will get you to it on SlideShare, and I'll tweet it out later. I want to let you know that the University of Albany, where I am a librarian, is not on the bleeding edge like many of you are regarding altmetrics. So the bulk of my role, uh, I'm technically the social welfare librarian, but um, Due to interest and 
initiative, I guess. I have become the, uh, the uh, research impact librarian. <laughs> so I work with the institutional repository administrator and we have developed a bit of a road show, uh, kind of a three ring circus as you can see by my, uh, my more lighthearted graphics. Uh, but what we do can be adapted. I teach um, a workshop for the general campus population. We branded under this thing called iLearn, but uh, it was meant to be for faculty, but mostly grad students and postdocs come to it. So um, we've done some extra legwork in terms of getting to departments. We've had to scale back and, and hit our three rings much more you know, what's really important and what can we do in 10 minutes? And then the other thing we've done is market to select groups, like um, there's a PhD association for counseling psychology candidates. And so we did a workshop with them with hands-on elements. I use Stacy's 30-day uh, impact challenge, is that what it's called? From a couple of years ago, I pulled some elements from that. Um, but we also use it as an opportunity, so we cover the traditional bibliometrics, we cover the altmetrics. Once they understand the limitations or um, benefits to the bibliometrics, then we can introduce the altmetrics, and then from there we get them with the open access. So um, uh, the magic of this, uh, we've had a, a long haul trying to educate our administration with this, but uh, this past fall we got the attention of the Vice President of Research, which is very exciting. That's a big exciting thing for us. We have a very bureaucratic uh, uh, institution, so um, we're, we're working with them to sort of develop an understanding of how these metrics can help them demonstrate our uh, significance as an R1 university, our research productivity, that sort of thing. So I'm very excited about that. Um, we do also intend to reach out to some specific uh, programs that have high graduate populations to make sure that they're also uh, getting involved with the metrics and the open access. So uh, School of Public Health, we have brand new. It's, uh, when I say brand new, maybe like seven years old, that's brand new to me. But um, we're hoping that they will um, also be a big adopter of this. And uh, I am told that I am done. So uh, come see me. Uh, I will tweet out the URL. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Francesco De Vigilio from Ubiquity Press uh, with the presentation New Altmetrics for Books, the Hermios Project. Well, hi, uh, my name is Francesco De Vigilio. I'm the uh, tech team leader at Ubiquity Press. Um, Ubiquity Press is an open access only international publisher and as uh, quite a long history in publishing. We've been around for five years, but it um, spun out of the Uni University College London uh, five years ago. Uh, I would say that my team, the technology team, represents uh, more or less 20, the 25% 20, the of the company. So we put a lot of effort in being up to date with technology, and we invest a lot in new technologies. Uh, this is why, this is why, um, Last year, we joined the Hermes project from the European Union. The Hermes project, name says it all really, is high integration of research monographs in the European open science infrastructure. Uh, basically, this means that the European Union is putting a lot of effort in uh, making the publishing of open access monographies in the humanities and social sciences consistent. And we know a lot of data is published every year, a lot of documents, open access documents, but you know, just publishing documents is not enough. Uh, we need to create links between the documents, we need to index the documents on services, and we need to build bridges to um, spread these documents across different disciplines. And this is the aim of the IRMES, of the IRMES project. Um, I like to see the advantage of this from two different perspectives, the advantage for the producer of the content and the advantage for the consumer of the content. Um, so on an upstream level, what the Hermes project is trying to do is to open the research process and uh, give access to the methods, software, and data which are used before actually publishing the open access um, article. On the other side, on the consumer side, the advantages, so on the, on the downstream side, the advantages are that 
we are trying to create bridges again across disciplines and support the aggregation and reuse uh, of these data and processes uh, across different disciplines. So now the EMOS project in itself is quite complex but relies on very simple concepts. The first one is the identification of the author documented funding, something we uh, all know really well. Uh, it's based on existing platform like ORCID, VY and FundRef. The second concept is the recognition of the person data locations inside the article, which basically means the index, indexing the content of the article. The third concept is the certification. So we, what we're trying to achieve with the EMOS project is to describe the peer review process which is being used to produce the article and describe the license which has been used to produce the article. Now, there is a last part to the EMOS project which uh, started this year, which is called Advanced Content and, re and um, it's all about uh, quantitative methods. Um, these will involve the gathering of open annotations from the hypothesis service, the usage metrics and the downloads, and the alt metrics. What the B2Press is doing is trying to build an, an open source platform to collect alt metrics. And this is pretty much how we think it will work. We've been working with this with open, open book publishers in Cambridge. And so basically the publisher will be able to upload the CSV with the DRI and the URL inside the service. We will, be, um, we will develop uh, different plugins, one for each data source. The system will be open source, completely pluggable, and all the data will be, uh, f um, will, uh, be distributed back to the publishers uh, using a REST API. And uh, we, will also be, uh, we will also provide a um, JavaScript widget the publisher will be able to embed in its own website to actually show the alt metrics. That's it. And finally today, we have Harish Farmer Saravari from Northern Illinois University with a presentation exploring features for predicting mentions in news. Hello everyone, uh, I'd like to start with a little bit of background. Uh, the amount of scientific literature being generated every year has increased drastically in the past decade. And a small part of this vast sea of literature eventually ends up uh, receiving news mentions. And with the rise of fact-checking journalism, receiving news mentions accords a certain degree of credibility to both the author and the work. Um, this gives rise to the question what makes certain research articles newsworthy and others not newsworthy? Uh, are there factors other than traditional news values that somehow uh, uh, contribute to the ultimate decision of uh, whether, whether a research article is newsworthy or not? Um, so understanding these would uh, help us not only predict the newsworthiness of research articles, but also uh, identify the sources of occasional inaccuracies and inconsistencies in science journalism. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so the data we used in this project uh, was provided by altmetric.com. It consists, the entire data set consists of more than 5 million articles, uh, of which around 400,000 articles received uh, news mentions. <coughs> The result was a highly imbalanced data set, so we decided to build a more balanced data set by randomly sampling 50,000 articles that had been mentioned in news at least once, and 50,000 articles that, have, that hadn't received even one news mention. And then we decided to build three classification models, uh, a random forest model, a support vector machine model, and a multinomial name based model. And the resu results were quite encouraging with uh, the random forest model delivering an accuracy of over 92%. Um, this indicates the possibility of existence of relationship between the altmetric features like uh, Twitter counts, Facebook counts, etc., cetera, and um, the, the newsworthiness of a research article. Um, that's it, I guess. Thank you. Thank you so much to all our presenters. Uh, it's a lot of fantastic and really fascinating research to um, collate into three minutes. Thank you also to your co-authors that couldn't be here with us today. Um, I'd like to invite you all to join us at the back of the room for a drink. 
All the presenters will be um, around the poster boards. Please do direct your questions to them. And we'll see you back here tomorrow at 9.45. Have a good evening.